Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com, and today we're going to be starting a new series. I had a lot of requests for people to go through the famous games on my website and give commentary on them. So, for those are, that are familiar with the website, the chesswebsite.com, the famous game section, I'm going to start with the old games. So, if you want to follow along and know which games are coming up, but I'm just going to go through the list and just start giving my commentary on each of the famous games. So the first game that we're going to talk about today is Anon vs. Joel Lodier. And as many of you know, Anon is the world chess champion right now. He's, he's probably a lot more known than Joel Lodier, but Lodier is a French GM. He's a very, very strong player, and he's also one of the three players to have beaten every world champion since 1975, which is a pretty amazing feat if you think about it. There's some amazingly strong players that he's beaten. So uh, with with that, I'm not going to tell you who won. I will tell you that Anon is playing the white pieces and Lodier is playing the black pieces. I don't want you to go in to the, any of these games that I give a commentary on and say because you know black lost or because white lost, all their moves are incorrect. That's usually not the case. It's usually one side just at one point or another, and I'll talk about that during the match. Makes a move that was just a phenomenal move, or the other the other side just strategically or positionally didn't make the best move at one particular spot. But the rest of his game could be completely fine. So just think about that going through. And as many of you know, a lot of the famous games are main are known famous because of one particular combination or sacrifice and so right before that that happens in each of these games I'm going to discuss I'm gonna go ahead and pause it and see if you can find that move yourself so without further ado I'm gonna go ahead and get into the game and give my commentary for it game starts with pawn 2e4 followed by pawn d5 this is the Scandinavian defense for those familiar with the Scandinavian defense Pawn's going to capture on d5, and black is going to capture on d5 with his queen. Already bringing his queen to the action, which at the top level you don't see that often, but in the Scandinavian defense you almost always will. White's going to continue with knight to c3. Simple development move for knight, bringing out a minor piece, and at the same time attacking the center and forcing the queen to move his major piece, his queen here, to move twice. So the queen's going to come to a5, standard move from black getting his queen out of harm's way and at the same time once white moves his pawn his d pawn here which he will very soon he's going to be pinning down this knight to the king so this is a common theme that you'll see in the scandinavian defense as far as bringing the queen to the a5 square from here white's going to continue bringing his pawn to d4 kind of as we just talked about and black's going to continue his development move with his minor piece with knight to f6. Simple development move at the same time attacking these light squares on d5 and e4. White's going to continue with his development move, knight to f3. Same theme here, he's trying to attack the dark squares here. So as you can already see, both sides are, are just developing their, their knights, trying to attack the center. The next move my black is pawn to c6. Now a lot of times people will try to get their bishops into the action, but black looked at this and he saw that if bishop came to g4, most times at top GM level you're not going to see this bishop actually sacrifice and exchange this knight here on f3. So white could just bring his pawn to h3 and he would kick his bishop back to h5. And after pawn to g4, black would come to g6 and so I guess that Lodier looked at this position and, and said you know what I just really don't want to bring my bishop here to g6 so instead of playing the very common bishop to g4 instead he played pawn to c6 and this is very common a lot of times when you see players that like the Kadokan pawn structure and this is exactly what that is they, they normally bring their pawn to c6 and then later on they'll bring their other pawn to e6 and as many of you know from Kaur Khan, anytime you have your pawns on c6 and e6, you normally want to get your light square bishop out first, then bring your pawn to e6, and then later you're going to bring your knight to d7. Common theme that anytime you, you start to see a opening develop at the top GM level, you can pretty much guess some of the moves that you'll see later on. So from here, White's going to continue with his own play. 
He's going to bring his bishop to c4. This is a very aggressive move. At the same time, he wants to get his light square bishop out and attacking this f7 square, which is a huge weakness for black at the early stages of the game since his king is very vulnerable here. At the same time, he wants to clear away if he wants to castle on the king side. It's, it's still up for debate if he's going to castle on the king side. It really depends on what black does. But um, most times, white will try to get his light, his light square bishop out, and at the same time, he'll try to get his knight to this f3 square, so that if he wants to, he can castle on the king side. From here, black's going to respond by bringing his bishop to f5. Simple development move. Also, he wants to get his light square bishop out again so that he can bring his pawn to e6. So that if he wants to, he can castle on the queen side. A lot of times in this Kawakan, a lot of players will castle on the queen side. Also, another move, it, going back a few moves, the, the c6 move, another good reason this is done is a lot of times people want to have a place for their queen to go. So you can see here that their queen may become vulnerable later on. It's not right now, but if they ever wanted to, now they have this dark diagonal that the queen can come to. So just another move. A lot of times GM players will make a move and have many reasons why they did it. So that may be another reason why Lodier did this when he moved his pawn to c6. From here, white's going to play knight to e5. Now he did have a few options here. He didn't have to bring his knight to e5, so if, if you guys following along or, or trying to figure out what you would have done, um, it would have been completely fine if he would have castled on the king side. This is a completely fine play. Um, but he decided to, to be aggressive and attack this pawn on f7, so he went ahead and brought his knight to e5 here. And if any of y'all have watched my other videos, I've always said don't bring your minor piece, move it twice if you don't have to. So in this case, you, you can pretty much note that, that Anand has a very specific plan um, that he wants to employ here because no GM player, no top player is going to bring their knight and move it twice without having a very good reason. So from here, Black really doesn't have a lot of moves that he can make that are very good. Um, he definitely does not want to bring his bishop back to g6 because white would jump all over this and exchange a knight for a bishop this early on in the game. So really his best move here is to bring his pawn to e6, blocking off this bishop from the f7 pawn. Now from here, Anon really starts to attack. As you can tell here, once you start to be aggressive, you really don't want to become passive because if you do, then you really just lost momentum. So what Anon was really thinking when he, when he played his knight to e5 after he saw e6, he now brought his pawn to g4, knowing that it can't be taken right now because his queen's covering it. And the bishop's going to have to retreat. And once it does retreat, the pawn's going to start pushing up to h4. Now already we can tell that more than likely the king, um, if he wanted to castle, now he can still castle on, on the king side, but um, if he wanted to castle, he could castle on the queen side, or he just may opt not to castle entirely. But what we can tell from here is he's going to start to push these pawns up to the king's side. So what Lodier was probably thinking is, you know, right now I'm not being attacked, so the first thing I need to do is I need to get some king safety. I need to go ahead and get this knight out of here, get him into the action, get as many minor pieces as I can into the action. At the same time, if I need to, I can castle on the queen side. So Lodier decided to bring his knight to d7. Again, this is a common theme. Anytime you have your pawn on c6 and e6, you normally want to bring your knight to d7. Um, you, you'll see this pretty much any time in the Karakhan. And from here, White decided to go ahead and, and exchange knights. So this knight that was here is going to come to d7, and then white's going to start pushing up the board on h5. Really, there's not many places for black to go here, but he did bring his bishop down to e4. Now, white had two options here, and when I looked at it, I personally would have opted for um, castle and kingside. And, and again, yes, you can castle kingside if the king is not attacked. Even if the rook is attacked, you, you can castle. Um, but Anon instead decided to bring his rook to h3. Later on, we'll see that he wanted to bring his rook to e3, and he noticed that if he castled on the king side, it would take him two moves to get his knight here, which if he brought it to h3 first, then he could get there a lot faster. So anytime you can save a move and you have a very specific plan, especially if it's a top play, go ahead and do it. Um, now from here, this is a questionable move from Lodier, as we, we can see later on. 
but he brought his bishop to g2. Now, personally, I think he should have brought his bishop back to d5 and just started exchanging pieces off here. But instead, he got a little greedy. He overextended his bishop, and he brought his bishop to g2.